Imagine this. You just moved into a nice, secluded neighborhood outside the city, just outside the suburbs, speaking into the tree line of a forest. You have Wi-Fi, electricity, a job that's a 30-minute drive away on a small road, and life is peaceful. All that's really changed is a change in scenery, maybe the local wildlife. That is, until a disaster strikes. One evening, you're watching TV, when you notice large plumes of smoke outside of your window. You switch channels over to the news, and you see live footage of a wildfire just north of where you live, maybe 10, 15 miles away, and it's moving fast. Questions start dashing through your mind. What should I bring? What do I need? Where's my phone? Should I empty out my car to fit my stuff? And the wildfire comes closer. After deciding what you want to bring, you take your stuff, toss them in your car, and you start driving. On small neighborhood roads with 300 of your neighbors, you pull out of your driveway to find a line of traffic stretching all along the small road you drive to work every single day. You look for other exits in your neighborhood, but traffic blocks you in. And the wildfire comes closer. You hear car alarms go off, honking, abandoned cars littering the streets. And you can't help but wonder, where is the police? Where is the fire department? Where are the ambulances? Who's guiding an evacuation? You pick up your phone to call relatives who are living in the city, and nothing. Cell service is dead. All you can do is sit and wait in traffic and hope that you can get out before the wildfire comes in. And the wildfire comes closer. You're stuck in this imaginary neighborhood that you put yourself in, and it's a living death trap. And it's what many people run the risk of experiencing today. Wildfires are dangerous, unpredictable, and uncontrollable. Given that much of California is brush and tinder during the summer months, having a defensive measure in effect can help mitigate the possible casualties in the event of a major wildfire. Time is of the essence when we're talking about a major fire, especially in these rural and highly vegetated neighborhoods, known as wildland urban interfaces, WIs, or WUIs. Now, in order to study how WUIs function in fire scenarios, I'm working with North Rodeo Gulch Firewise, a Santa Cruz community of around 300 residents, all living along a small four-mile road with dozens of side branches. The problem with these roads is that a lot of them are single lane roads. Imagine evacuation going one direction and emergency services coming in the other direction, and you can see the problem. They stop each other. They both get delayed. And expanding these roads isn't a possible option either, because North Rodeo Gulch lies on winding roads. If you wanted to expand these roads, you'd have to cut into mountains, which isn't exactly cost feasible. Communication is thus vital between North Rodeo Gulch and emergency services. And yet, some emergency services often don't voice their opinions or their thoughts on what the community should do in the event of a wildfire. Now, from a bureaucratic standpoint, it makes complete sense because it protects the police departments, the fire departments, and the hospitals that would be giving advice. They could be held liable if someone decided to get hurt. But this complete lack of communication is worrying at best and terrifying at worst. In a wildfire scenario, different organizations, including, but not limited to, California Highway Patrol, the local sheriff, and the local fire departments, all work together in order to do a couple things. Gather information, create a plan, then execute it. Now, in suburbs, cities, this process can take as short as seven to 14 minutes. However, in WUIs, this process can take as long as 30 to 60 minutes. 
time in which residents are left vulnerable, out of contact with the authorities, and helpless. Power companies aren't a huge help either, as they often shut down their power when a wildfire happens because if their equipment gets damaged and their power is on, it can start another fire. No power means no cell service, no internet, no Wi-Fi, no communication, especially between emergency services and the people they're trying to help. This can cause a disconnect between the two and cause chaos because they don't know what each other is doing. On top of this, local authorities might not even know the layout of the area they're trying to help, which furthers that disconnect. Now, even if communication between a community and emergency services was perfect, it still doesn't discount the possibility of someone being left behind or stranded with no communication available to them. Now, in this scenario, the best possible option is to either evacuate if possible or to shelter in place. But what do you do if you're with someone who's injured? Do you stay behind and help them but risk yourself? Or do you evacuate and leave them behind because you can? What happens when the evacuation route you know like the back of your hand suddenly gets blocked by debris? Not everyone can know exactly what to do in an emergency scenario. And even people who are prepared can easily go into shock and forget all the plans and preparation that they put out. At times like these, when cars litter the streets, when cell service means nothing and all seems lost, giving people reliable offline information can give them the foundation in order to make smarter decisions. The solution resides in good communication before a crisis. Es evacuation especially, because once communication breaks down, communities and emergency services can't coordinate in the moment to make a plan. If someone decides to do something unprecedented, everyone else would have to adapt and respond. Imagine evacuating five miles south of where you live because you didn't know that the fire department cleared the debris half a mile north. Making sure everyone's on the same page will ensure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing with no ambiguity. This is the time to set plans, design protocols, and put down the most effective communication lines possible in order to make sure that everyone knows what everyone else is doing, and no one's in the dark. I built a computer that I call a fire evacuation toolkit. It's customized around this idea of offline wildfire preparedness. My vision is that this can equip homeowners, residents, anyone at risk of a wildfire with the possibility of having information available to them when they're in the dark. It has, or will have, GPS capabilities. It can have downloaded websites, data on customizable storage in the form of a micro SD card. This can have maps, medical information, and instruction. What this means is that this toolkit can equip homeowners with the ability of making decisions that they could never make alone. So, first, GPS. GPS stands for Global Positioning System. The short version of how GPS works is that you have a satellite, well, three of them actually, that can talk with any GPS receiver. Now, using trilateration, the speed of light, and a whole bunch of math, the receiver can calculate its longitude and latitude. Toss in a fourth satellite there, and now you have your altitude as well. So what does this mean? This means that we already have a method of finding someone's location that doesn't rely on cell service, internet, nothing. It just needs a receiver. And the fire evacuation toolkit has a GPS receiver in the form of a USB device. This gives the owner of the toolkit the ability 
to find their location along with the downloaded map. And we'll just leave it there. <laughs> along with the downloaded map and know where they are exactly. But that's not all. What if they need to evacuate? This is what we're talking about at all, right? So evacuation can't just be done with a GPS. This is where things like egress videos, where your community can record certain areas in your location that can be used in order to get out instead of panicking and running around looking for an exit. Egress videos, as long as you have a GPS as well as your own location, can be vital in any community in terms of crisis. Next, websites. The internet can tell you anything. It can tell you how to make banana pancakes. It can tell you how many hours you should sleep in order to complete your REM sleep cycle. It can tell you your Hogwarts house based on your favorite cereal. It's Gryffindor, but we're not interested in that. What we're looking for is information that we can use during a wildfire. So, what is that? Medical information, so first aid, and survival information, because you're in the middle of a wildfire. So, we have the information we're looking for. But where can we find them? Where are the sources? Well, Wikipedia is an easy one. Fun fact, did you know that the entirety of English Wikipedia can be compressed to as small as 20 gigabytes? For context, the amount of storage that I have in this toolkit is 512 gigabytes, and it's on a swappable micro SD card. Now, couple Wikipedia with a couple purpose-built websites like Survivor Library, Project Gutenberg, and now you have a whole repertoire of information that can be accessed and downloaded for use offline. Survivor Library is this page where you can find multiple pages on medical information, such as splinting someone in the wilderness or cauterizing a wound rudimentarily. Project Gutenberg specializes in ebooks and has over 60,000 books available right now. As time goes on and more resources become available to us, the more information we can put on the toolkit. And lastly, professional additions. Now, working on this project, I've had the privilege of working with some of the best people in terms of emergency evacuation. ARIES is a volunteer-run organization that specializes in connecting emergency organizations by ham radio when their normal methods of communication breaks down. CERT is another volunteer organization that specializes in civilian training, where they train civilians to do some jobs that emergency operators need to do in order to make their jobs more efficient. Now, imagine the amount of experience that any one person in these fields has. Now, imagine if you knew the exact same things that they do. We're talking FireWise, FireSafe, California Highway Patrol, CAL FIRE, Central FIRE. You wouldn't even know where to begin. Now, unless you're holding a secret second life, I wouldn't expect you to. But you can have this information at your fingertips if it was saved on a toolkit. You could have information like PDFs of the most common radio frequencies in case you wanted to have a radio to connect yourself when power goes out. You could know what material you should wear in the event of a wildfire so it burns off of you instead of melt on your skin. This is the type of information that these more experienced professionals already know. Stuff that you and I might not know and might not need to know, but it wouldn't hurt to have with us regardless. The Fire Evacuation Toolkit solves all of the logistical problems that I've mentioned about evacuation in a wildfire. 
It acts as this bridge of communication by saving data in the form of offline information by professionals in order for them to communicate with you when they can't do it directly. The more trained professionals that know about this project, the more experience we can gain from them and experience that we can put into the toolkit by their own recommendation, handpicked by them. I want people to know what to do in an emergency because I don't want them to go through more stress and more misunderstanding when they're in the middle of an emergency. North Rodeo Gulch Firewise is the first community that I wanted to help. But if we look at the bigger picture, communication is a problem in any natural disaster. Avalanches and tornadoes destroy everything in their path. Tsunamis and hurricanes can flood entire cities. Earthquakes, heat waves, landslides, blizzards, snowstorms, thunderstorms, all these different natural disasters all do the same things. They can split people apart and put them in danger. Without communication, people can be lost. People will be lost unless we do something. The fire evacuation toolkit is just a single step in the face of natural disaster preparedness. There's still a long way to go before my vision of a worldwide natural disaster toolkit can be turned into reality. But hopefully, it's a sign for a better future. More reliable information in people's hands can guide them into facing hardship with a better chance of survival. This idea of common knowledge has the potential to save lives. This is my message to a small, vulnerable community in Santa Cruz. My message to communities just like them all across the United States. My message to countless people all around the world who suffer from natural disasters. Reliable offline communication can be the difference between life and death. And that is a message I want to spread like wildfire. Thank you.